Today we're going to be doing a solo run in Pokemon Red and Blue with Obstagoon. Now this might not be a Pokemon you think of when you are thinking of powerful Pokemon from other generations, but I just have to admit that I love this Pokemon and I love the word Goon. New evolutions to existing Pokemon or regional variants are both things that I really like and this long tongued rock star covers both of those boxes for me. I'll also die on a hill and say that this Pokemon has the best shiny of pretty much all of them. I think it's really unique and it doesn't do the typical Pokemon shiny where you just usually make something green, black, or purple and that probably covers like 80% of Pokemon. And I guess you could just say it looks like a tube of Colgate toothpaste but keep your bad opinions to yourself. Obstagoon is a dark and normal type. It's very unique outside of the Alolan Rattata line and its only weaknesses are things that don't exist or are just very weak in Kanto. So I think it's going to have a good time today as long as we don't get hit with any fighting moves. As for the stats, we have a really solid base to work with. There's nothing that just kind of jumps off the charts, but everything is above average. And if you are wondering how I pick which stat will be the special stat, I just choose the highest. I call it the Chansey rule. For this run, I went with two new moves in Cross Chop and Nightshade, and I'll come back to those later, but I just kept everything else vanilla. Now you got things like Pin Missile and Lick to round out the starting move pool, but they're not really going to see much use. The thing to look out for is a Stabbed Headbutt at level 12 and home claws is a move that raises your attack and your accuracy but I substituted it with meditate which isn't as good but it's pretty much the closest thing that gen 1 has. A new move that is missing is obstruct. It's Obstagoon's signature move and it functions like a better version of moves like protect or detect but I simply do not have the tech or the knowledge to make that into a generation 1 move currently but it wouldn't really have much impact on the run either way. As for the TM list it continues the tradition of normal Pokemon having an incredibly long list to choose from. But in terms of Generation 1, Body Slam, since we are a normal type, just stands out along with great coverage moves like Dig, Blizzard, and Thunderbolt. And there's even Surf in there, which is more funny to me just to imagine this thing surfing, you sitting on its back and it riding around. Not really that useful to the run, but just kind of funny. And before we dive in, I'd like to say that likes and comments, they go a long way in helping channels grow. So if you want to help me out, help the channel out, or you just enjoy solo run content, whether you are somebody new, someone who normally just doesn't think about that sort of thing, or even if you are a returning subscriber like Pal Molly, I want you to scroll down and I actually want you to tell me this week how you think Obstagoon is going to stack up against some of the elite runs. I generally write down my intro before I've actually done the run, so I have to say that I'm personally a little skeptical, but I think it can be around a time like Tinkaton, but I'm not sure it's S rank material just yet. But that's enough talking, I think you guys can sit back, relax, grab yourself a soda pop and let's see how this thing does. The first thing I would like to say about this run is the sprite. It's amazing. This isn't my artwork. A while ago, last year, I got permission from a very talented artist. His name is Pat Ackerman. I do have his socials leaked in the description if you want to look at that. And you notice when I pick the Pokemon, the sprite in the game is much more saturated than the sprite there. That's because I use a modified version of the game and it uses Gen 2 color palettes. So that's why there's a discrepancy there. As for the rival battle, I just kind of use Night Slash and this one is over very quick, but notice how I crit both times, and this kind of segues us into the new moves for the run. We can talk about them now, and we'll just cover them both at the same time. Cross Chop is a 100 base power fighting move with the huge drawback of 80% accuracy. It's situational. It's not really going to see that much use. On the other hand, we have Night Slash. It does get stabbed. It has 70 base power, and it's going to be our bread and butter for the whole run. Both of these moves are a high crit move and since Obstagoon has high base speed and generation 1 uses your speed to determine your crit rate this means they will crit every single time. The guaranteed crit is really what makes the Obstagoon get a huge bump in power and what that translates into terms of actually playing the run is that I only have to do the bare minimum the one bug catcher and then we can go straight to Brock.
Now with a super effective guaranteed crit move like Cross Chop in our toolbox, you would think that that would be the way to go, but not so fast my friend. Brock's Pokemon have a disgustingly high defense with low special, and since Dark type moves are all special before the Gen 4 split, they roughly do about the same damage, with the difference being that Night Slash has a 20% higher chance to hit, so that's what you're going to see here. Now there's no hiccups, Obstagoon grabs its badge, and we can continue on the way. After that, things are kind of standard. I keep it to the bare minimum with no extra battles, and being in the medium fast leveling group means that we are only a mere level 14 when we reach Cerulean, and you might think that this is going to be a problem, and when I was practicing, I was kind of worried about it. But it's actually Misty that kind of saves the day. Night Slash is a great move, but the key here is that it's super effective against Starmie. Now with Obstagoon's solid defensive stats, I'm not in any real danger, and while taking out Misty Misty early does feel good, the real prize here is that it gives us an extra two levels when we're looking ahead to rival number two. And like with most runs, your lose condition revolves mainly around sand attack, but here Pidgeotto uses quick attack first, and since I do have a faster speed and I can two shot it, I'm going to avoid it in today's video. And with the sand attacking menace down the rest of his team, it just really doesn't stand a chance, and I'm going to just continue slicing my way through this early game. It is worth noting that I did make a mistake with the ROM. My level 18 move was supposed to be Fury Swaps, and I accidentally put in Fury Attack in the code. It's insignificant, but I'm just going to point it out. Now from here, Headbutt's extra damage is enough to easily stretch out the uses of Nightshade, and once again, we're staying on that bare minimum path, and I think we can take it all the way down to the SSN after that. Now I think you guys already know what the prize is here. Normal types, they're always licking their chops when it's time to get Body Slam, and while it's a great move it's kind of the secondary move when it comes to this run from there let's take a look at rival number three and there's not much to say we now have a stab body slam an extra level since the last time we fought the rival so there's pretty much zero chance of getting sand attack today and obstagoon we cruise through this one it's starting to come into its own around this time in the game now as for surge we do get access to dig but we simply just don't need it today body slam is great here but i probably should have swapped to not slap after I got growled, but the result is the same. It's just a tiny little mistake. After the battle, I do get Thunderbolt, but when everything was finally optimized in this run, the smart thing to do was just to hang on to it until the end of the game because it's just not needed for things like the slow pokes in Rock Tunnel or the Rival Starter for a while. Now we can just skip ahead all the way to Celadon, and the Rocket Hideout is our first order of business. I do pick up just one of the PP ups here just because of how much this run relies on Night Slash, and I think just to be more efficient, it's better just to go ahead and use one of them now. I am picking up the high money items and now we can just kind of take a look at Giovanni and I mainly just want to point out that cross chop is just not that great of a move. I loathe lower accuracy moves and basically across the board throughout the whole run Night Slash is going to do about the equivalent damage and it just wasn't really as helpful as I thought it would be. Now I do use it on the Kangaskhan just to get some uses out of it but I probably should have just stuck with using Night Slash. After that this is where I made one of the big optimizations for the run and kind of the cleanup from my previous runs. I'm directly going to shop now and earlier I was holding off until later when I had more money and while this does mean less vitamins and overall less power, I do think it saves some time and it was well worth it here. I sell everything that I can, I don't keep any of the TMs on the top floor and I'm able to afford 5 calciums when it's all said and done. After getting fly, I steamroll through Pokemon Tower, I don't need any strategy here, I mainly just go for Night Slash, it's easy and we can easily get past the Ghastlies as well, so we can just move on. Down in the Safari Zone, it's worth noting that I'm skipping the Carbos as well as the Protein here. Now the Carbos, it could help in one specific spot, and the extra power is always welcome, but when I was trimming down the fat just to get the absolute fastest Obstagoon time possible, these are kind of the little things that I cut out just to save whatever precious seconds that I could and really push this Pokemon to its limit. So at this point, you might be saying, so is this run nothing but not slash spam and the answer is no because if we take a look at Erica you can see that I go straight body slam to get past this one I do crit the victory bell but it really didn't matter now I have a scary potential time loss at the end I get put to sleep but thankfully I wake up really quick and we're just kind of cruising at this point now I'm gonna rush Sylph this is something that isn't as easy as some of the other spots that I could have gone to 
too, but I knew if I really wanted Obstagoon to have a nice run, getting this down now could save some precious time when we see the final result. Now like the rest of the run so far, it's the minimum track, but I do kind of run into a scare here. Machoke is a fighting type, and even though I'm double weak to fighting, I just simply don't respect fighting types in Gen 1, and I get hit with the low kick, and it does a good chunk to me. Now continuing on, I make a second mistake, but first, I finally do learn a coverage move in Thunderbolt, but I forget to heal going into what is normally one of the toughest fights in the game, and from there, I think we can just take a look at rival number five. Now you can see my health here, and I got a little nervous. Thunderbolt is far off from a one-shot, but Arceus, he blesses us, and it actually misses the sand attack, and that might be just the little opening that I need to weasel a victory out here. And the rest of the fight, it's not really that suspenseful. I know I'm low on health, but Night Slash with Thunderbolt coverage at the end is great, but there's two things that I really love about Obstagoon. The first is that it's one of the biggest walls to psychic types, and with Night Slash, both the eggs Execute and the Alakazam, they're pretty much just free wins, and that feels really good considering how they usually are in runs. Now some people might say this looks boring when Alakazam is kind of reduced to the clown that it really is, but we're all allowed to have bad opinions, and you can think that if you want to. The thing that doing Sylph early provides in red and blue version is you get access to Lapras, and this is the Pokemon that you're going to be using to use Strength and Surf for the most part. Now if you can knock this place out before you go down to Koga, it just kind of eliminates an extra extra backtrack, and overall it's a little bit of a time save. But for Obstagoon specifically, it unlocks access to Sabrina's juicy ass, and the goon, he's thirsty today. Now keep in mind that Dark Top is completely immune to psychic damage, so there's actually very little that she can even do to us in general, and the only potential hiccup the fight could have is the Venomoth that has a bug move, and we're weak to bug. But what's funny about Generation 1 is that even with Stab and the super effective bonus, Leech Life is only at 60 effective power, which is actually kind of sad. So if you ever wonder why people say bug tops absolutely suck in Generation 1, there's your answer. And I must say overall that doing Sabrina as the fifth gem does feel a little bit strange. Now let's keep this Night Slash train going by paying a visit to Uncle Koga, and while we don't have super effective damage, the guaranteed crit just makes up for that. The important thing here is that doing Sylph and Sabrina first, it puts puts us into a guaranteed one-shot territory for the coughings, and while the muck and the wheezing are a little bit tankier, it just made this one a little bit more safe, and there's not really much more to say about it. With six badges down, a swift swim down to Cinnabar is about the only thing left to do, and I didn't really save Blaine until the end for a specific reason, that's just kind of how it played out. Now the only thing to note here is that I pick up Blizzard for later, and after answering the age-old question of a Doomstoner, brother, can solve of our life problems, we can take a gander at the gym battle. And like with Erica, there's actually a little wrinkle here, I guess. Now the plan is to go nightshade on pretty much everything, but I bring in Body Slam for the Rapidash. The chairman of the fan club, he's shedding a tear right now, and I take it out. Overall, a Fire Blast crit or something like that could make this fight a little bit dangerous, but Obstagoon is doing a fantastic job, and I don't think that the final Giovanni gym is going to be that much of a challenge either. Now the thing that I would like to take a look at like I did with a Tyranitar Sanqui run is the black belt with the three fighting types. It could be a little bit dangerous. Without boost, it just kind of lingers around a little bit too long and if you're like me and you forget about it, it can cost you some resets and it did in some of my tests. The important thing here and something I haven't even talked about the whole run is that we have meditate. I use it here, I use it once and it guarantees you can one shot every one of these Pokemon with body slams and it just kind of makes this one safer overall. And I I think you guys know that a fight is going to be kind of easy when I spend more time talking about one of his underling trainers more than I am going to be talking about him. Now the main thing is that I only speed tie the Doug Trio and we did see in the Groudon run that one sand attack can ruin your day and I would say that this fight overall wasn't exactly clean. I do get poisoned and even though Night Slash does its thing, I'm in kind of a position where I have to go heal after the fight or use some items. And since I'm on a great pace, 
base here. I opt to go ahead and use a full restore. I use an elixir and I go ahead and use every single one of my 10 rare candies now in preparation for rival number six. And I think we can just take a look at that. The rare candies were very important for this fight because it puts us at essentially full power and it gives us much better ranges and our damage throughout the fight. With Thunderbolt, the Pidgeot goes down with a single hit and from there, Night Slash Supremacy reigns once again. Night Slash on the Blastoise is a thing you could do, but Thunderbolt critting would make it a turn faster, so that's kind of why I go for that. Now it's time for the Elite Four, and we are pretty much already set, and with today's optimizations, I will be skipping the Rare Candy and Victory Road, because it just doesn't really help us anywhere. Now I think we can focus on Lorelei, and let's just kick off the beginning of the end. With Thunderbolt and Not Slash for Jinx, this one goes about how you would think. Now overall, Obstagoon felt really good to play, but this fight, it reminds me of something like Lapras's late game. It's really solid, it has great moves, but it just misses that sheer raw power that maybe something like Articuno, Groudon, Mewtwo, Alakazam, all of them have. And while we do make it through, and our time is great, I think this is kind of a showcase of why Obstagoon's not going to be the top dog when the video's over. Next up is Bruno, and you might be wondering why I'm hanging on to Meditate, and it's pretty much for this battle, which is kind of weird to say. Night Slash is pretty useless on the fighting types, and if you miss the range to one shot with Body Slam, it opens you up for a lethal counter, and all it takes is one single Meditate to put Thunderbolt into a guaranteed one hit range on the Hitmonchan and Hitmonlee, and it just makes this one a lot more comfortable. Now this is generally longer than I spend talking about Bruno, but when you're double weak to fighting, I think caution is probably the best approach when you're trying to have a perfect run. You don't want to screw it up this late. Now before we go to Agatha, I'm going to say that she's kind of the Bruno of this run, but I do finally get rid of Body Slam in favor of Blizzard here. I could have gotten rid of Meditate, but the truth is, it really doesn't matter what I got rid of. With really good speed and massive super effective damage on the ghost type Pokemon, this one goes how you would think. Now this one is about as clean as a fight really can get, and the only only potential problem you could even have here is maybe you miss a range on the Arbok, but overall it's a fairly weak Pokemon and it's just not an issue. This one's very clean, dark type against Ghost, there's not really much more to say about it. Lance is the appetizer before the champion dinner and I don't really need to go too much into this one. Now we have Thunderbolt for the Gyarados, we have Blizzard for the rest. On the optimized run, I didn't pick up any extra PP ups, so you could get some bad luck, you could lose some time if you start to miss your 90% accurate blizzard, but it doesn't come into play here. And overall, this is where Obstagoon's coverage and deep move pool really comes in clutch. And I think we can move on. We can take a look at the champion. First up is the Pidgeot. We have Blizzard now. We can kind of just clip this bird's wings and we can move on. Next, I've said it a million times, but I never get tired of seeing Alakazam just being reduced to something trivial. It and Gyarados, they're often the most oppressive Pokemon in these runs, and it really just warms my heart to see them bleed from time to time. Right on, it's only a one shot with Blizzard, and we'll come back to Blizzard in a second, but it goes down, and then after that, we go back to the tried and true Night Slash for Arcanine. We take it out in a couple of hits, and now it's time for Executor. And I think a solid review of this run would be that there's a little bit too much Blizzard RNG near the end, and it gets a little dicey at times without PP ups, and this is kind of another place you can use it, just so you have that chance to one shot. Now I do hit, I don't get the one shot, and I do have Night Slash, it does super effective damage, I can finish it off, and we can see the end of the fight. Now as for the Blastoise, it's the same thing. Thunderbolt has a chance to one shot it, but I was kind of, I was done rolling the dice at this point, so I just go for two Night Slashes, I tank a Hydro Pump for my trouble, and it goes down, and that's the run over. And that's it. Obstagoon has done it. Now as far as cross-gen runs go, it finishes just short of Skeledurge's final time by about 30 seconds with a final in-game time of 2 hours, 14 minutes, and 36 seconds. And honestly, that's way better than I thought it would do. Now keep in mind, I essentially did the bare minimum here. I didn't grind any extra trainers for levels, and I even skipped pickups and things like the final rare candy. But like I said earlier, 81 base special, it leaves a little bit to be desired when you start to get 
it later in the game, but Night Slash, it really carried the run, and it was impressive to see it take something that would probably have just been pretty good, and kind of raise it to what would be pretty much an S tier run on the regular tier list. Overall, I was pleasantly surprised that a Pokemon that I just really like, and I really enjoy, it's just a personal favorite of mine, I really like that it did so well at the end of the day, and it's a worthy addition to these type of runs. And once again, special shout out to my channel members. You guys and your support just mean a lot to me. I can't thank you enough. And if you are this far into the video, I really appreciate you. If you aren't subscribed for some reason, then I really need more people like you to get that retention time up because that's an extremely important metric for growing a channel. But huge shout out to anyone that's hearing my voice right now. But I think that's pretty much all I have for you guys, and I'll catch you on the next one. Bye!